is the Seahawkers podcast, a special NFL Combine preview episode. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers, and joining me, a special guest today, Mr. Rob Staten of SeahawksDraftBlog.com. Rob, it is that time of year again. I know it, I get to this point and I think, gosh, you know, you and I have not talked all season. You've got your stuff going on. You've got the draft. And I've got my stuff going on. It just... It always works out that we just get to this time of year and, and I'm finally getting around to uh, to talk draft with you. Yeah, it is a very exciting time having the combine and and just a whole bunch of information that's going to come out of this. It helps shape the draft. I think the combine, what generally what you get at this time of year, Brandon, is a lot of conversation about the worth of the combine. I think it's important to stress that you know, in 90, 90 times out of 100 times in the NFL, the better athlete wins in, in the 1v1 matchups that you have at you know, various points in a game of football. And you know this is a great test to see on a, on a level playing field with everybody in the same building at the same time, who are those best athletes. Now, athleticism and, and physical profile don't mean everything, of course. It's only part of the projection. But you learn so much from an event like this. and You come out afterwards with a, a, a far greater idea of who the Seahawks might draft because Pete Carroll and John Schneider have been here for a long time now and there's plenty of trends to look at. So I think it's a fascinating week at the Combine and I can't wait for it to start. Well, it is one of the benefits of having a long-term coach and GM because you do get a, a really good sense of the trends. And I know that's something that you've been tracking ever since the start of this. Gosh, you know, just to give you an idea, I was thinking about this this past week, Rob, of how long you and I have been doing this because Ali Marpet, I remember you and I <laughs> talking Ali Marpet and uh, before he even got drafted and now he has retired from the NFL. Yeah, uh, it really does make you feel old, <laughs> isn't it? How, you know, I was thinking the other day that, um, you know, I started Silk Strap Blog in 2008 yeah. and... <laughs> You know, thought if you'd have said at the time you, you'd be doing this in five years, I would have probably laughed at that thought. And here we are, you know, what is it, 13, 14 years later now, and um, still doing it. We've done this for a long time. Think of all those great players we've discussed that have gone on to great things with other teams. And, uh, and uh, let's identify some more now for this year. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you talk about the importance of the combine, and I'm kind of curious to to know what you think in terms of just the fact that we didn't get a combine last year. And so how did that really have an impact on some of the stuff that you look at? Is it really as important as maybe we thought it was before? Yeah, I think it's very, very important. And I missed it last year uh, because you just don't have the same information and the teams didn't either. And I think it played a, a huge part in why the Seahawks ultimately were very comfortable going into that draft with just three picks and didn't trade down to try and acquire more. I think they basically wrote that draft off to a degree because they didn't have the information that they usually have. They didn't have that ability to meet players in person, to bring people into their facility to, to speak to them. They didn't have all of the testing numbers at the combine. They only had the testing numbers of specific pro days. Some players didn't even have pro days. It, it was an incomplete process and the fact that it is back this year and the NFL has tried to make a complete dog's dinner of this combine by insisting that as you know Indianapolis basically removed all of their COVID restrictions in the middle of February and yet they were asking the players to to remain in a strict bubble and and not go anywhere don't go out for dinner don't have the don't, people that uh, have they normally there. have there yeah yeah, don't have the trainers there, so you can do your proper preparation and warm-ups. And the players quite rightly said, well, this is ridiculous, and we're not coming if you're going to do this. And the NFL just caved immediately and said, well, go on then, do what you want. And, and I wish that they'd gone a little further, actually, and would, would maybe throw the weight around a little bit more sometimes. I think the players should be... I think there should be a financial incentive for players to do every drill because I think you you want that information. You don't want players thinking, "Ah, do you know what? I'm not going to do a short shuttle after all, or I'm not going to do this." You know, if there was a fight, if you if if it was essentially you're going to earn this much to do everything, I think it would encourage players to, to do everything, and and I think it makes it a proper event. I've seen people saying it's a job interview. You shouldn't be paid for a job interview, but it's not a job interview, is it? The, 
you know, these players are going out there and they are performing. They are showing off their their, their athletic yeah. skill. And yeah, it's a re- so, there's a reason why they moved it to prime time. It's because they want more people to watch. They want to bring in the television money. Shoot, this is going to be one of the first year where they have fans, I guess, in the lower bowl watching uh, these athletes perform. So I wonder if, if okay, there's not the financial motivation, but I wonder if there will be some of that pressure that's felt by them to go out and perform for the fans in the stands. I hope so. I, two years ago, it was it was frustrating because what you had was you, you got your list of players set to run the 40, for example, and then they'd skip by four players. And you'd think, well, what's, why is this any good for prime time? And already Derek Stingley, the um, LSU cornerback, is one of the biggest names in the draft, has decided he's not going to work out and do anything because he's still recovering from a list frank injury. Mm. And you do wonder a little bit, well, You've moved this to prime time. If it reduces the number of star players actually performing at your combine, isn't that detrimental to the fact that it's a prime time experience? So I think the NFL should do everything it can to ensure that more and more players actually compete at this event. But it's still a great event, and I love everything about it. You know, the the reporting and all the speculation about what's going to happen in free agency as well really builds during this weekend. I think it's a particularly important free agency period for the Seahawks. And I, I probably said that, and you may well have said that as well, Brandon, for the last sort of two or three years, and, and it never quite happens. Well, last year, I think we, we couldn't really place the emphasis on it with only having three draft picks. And then they go and do they just stick with those three draft picks. So yeah, yeah as, as important as last offseason was, uh, it turned out to be uh, just not as important for the team. I, it just feels, it just feels, you know, with the combination of free agency and the draft, it's been a series of damp squibs with the Seahawks. And we're all kind of desperate to see another 2013 off, uh, you know, preseason off season, aren't we? Where, you know, they go and land a couple of really big name players, you know, in Bennett and Averill. And look, that's never going to happen again in the way that it did. But, you know, I, just if they could go and if there was a bit of talk this week as well, you know, apart from all the workouts, if there's a bit of talk that, you know, the Seahawks are going to be big players at free agency or something, or they're going to go and make a big move or, you know, if they get linked with somebody, it's just, okay, it's, it's gossip, it's it's hearsay, it's rumor and speculation, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's what's, you know, gets you through an off season sometimes, just the, the thought of signing a player or the hope that is created by a, you know a bit of speculation. So I'm I'm hoping there's going to be a bit of juicy gossip about the Seahawks as well in this week in Indianapolis. Yeah, definitely. It kicks off that uh, that time period. Sometimes you hear about the deals, and yeah, it, there is that potential. And you know, as as important as the draft is, I think I think part of the reason why you can you can say every year really going into it is is how important it is. I, because, gosh, Rob, I mean, the draft, it doesn't mean a whole lot if your team can't pick players who can push out the job of an established starter or at least push them to be better players. And I think that's something that it's been missing now. Part of it can be due to the fact that they where they're picking. But at the same time, I mean, they were picking guys in the fourth, fifth that were pushing guys and and becoming early on starters. So. And I don't know with with the depth of this draft this year. It, do you see that? Uh, do you see there being any potential there for that? I think there's absolutely the potential there for that. It reminds me a little bit of when Tim Ruskell was the GM, and once the sort of the second and third round was out of the way, you, you kind of felt like the the rest of the picks. You know, some sort of rounds four to seven were almost well. We'll just throw a few darts and see what's out there. And, and they never really expected much. And then when Carolyn Schneider came in and they started producing world-class players on day three of the draft, it elevated expectations somewhat of what you're going to get in that, in that range. And it is a bit frustrating that, um, you know, the, the draft a guy with huge potential in Colby Parkinson and talk him up, but you never actually see him on the field. Right. And, you know, a number of players who they've drafted and, and, and maybe have shown a promise in a training camp for a preseason and they can't get out there because they're, they're standing by this aging journeyman instead because they've, you know, Carol has really gone away from the, we're going to blood our youngsters and take our lumps with them to, to a more conservative approach with veterans. I want to ask you about that because do you think that, do you think that's a Pete Carroll issue or do you think that that may have been a Ken Norton Jr.? problem 
who knows? I mean, it, we'll never know the the complete yeah. makeup of who decides what and, and whatever. I kind of generally kind of lean towards Carroll just because he's the head coach and ultimately it's his choice. If sure. he wanted young players to be played, you would think he would just go, you're playing Alton Robinson more. But then, you know, you, you come, you look at the snap counts at the end of the year and you think, you know, why is, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say one week, oh, you know, Alton Robinson gets a big sack and a force fumble in the game. And he get and Carroll will inevitably get asked about it afterwards, and he'll say we need to get him more snaps. And then the following week, you play even less snaps than the week before, <laughs> right. you know. And it, it's just there's no rhyme or reason to it. So you know, we did I, I we did get to see some Trey Brown. Unfortunately, he gets hurt, um, and you know maybe we wouldn't have seen Trey Brown if not for injuries at the position. But yeah, I, I'd like to see a return to that though. You know, I, I hope that I think with this draft because of the depth and options. After the first round, I think if if you if you're going to have a draft where you didn't have a first round pick, this is probably one of the better ones. I mean, I, I suppose you, equally you could say if you had that number eleven pick, you could probably trade down, which the Seahawks are known to do, get another third, get another fourth, and be in an even better position. And they'd have a first round pick as well. <laughs> right. So, you know, there's never a good year to have a no first round pick. But you know, there are options there. They have an extra fourth, which is right at, that, at the start of the fourth because it's from the Jets. So um, I think there's an opportunity to get four, you know, in those two rounds, two, three, four, to get four really good players. And then I want to see them get a chance to play, you know, give them a chance to go and play. And I, and I really hope as well, Brandon, as, as I'm sat here talking about an aggressive free agency and wanting the Silks to be really proactive, I really hope they don't end up trading, you know, that, that one of those fourths away for some like 30-year-old has been <laughs> right. or like a third for like a rental you know, and and then reduce the amount of picks they've got because I, you know, I'm not quite all in on the LA Rams approach to this. Of, you know, I, I read an article earlier of someone saying they should trade their next two first round picks in the next two years to, for Xavier and Howard, and I was just like, no, don't do that. You know, just bring back DJ Reed instead. You don't need to start giving away your picks. I think is you can. I think what I personally, you know, I know we're talking about the combine here, but what I'd personally like to see is, you know. Do a deal with Russell Wilson to free up some cap space. Sure, and go and spend it. I, I think that's possible. You can, you could even extend Bobby and spread out that money a little bit. There, there are ways to create some additional cap space. And because, I mean, you're right, Rob. This, this is the window. I mean, Russell Wilson is getting into his mid 30s, and so we're kind of getting to that time to where you you start thinking about. Okay, maybe you don't go all in in the same style that the Rams did with giving away picks, but you can go all in in other ways in terms of how you manage your salary cap and pushing things back somewhat similar to, you know, how the Saints have have managed their cap and they're paying for it now. But that's kind of they were in that window with Drew Brees. And I think when you have that quarterback, because, gosh, i have reading your draft blog about this quarterback class. Uh, you, you can run in, you can have your picks, and then you can run into a class where there aren't any quarterbacks at all. And, you know, then you're just, I mean, it's so tough to find a quarterback. It, it really is. And I, and I think that I, I personally like to see an extension. And um, I think the average per year, I'm not one of these people who thinks that Wilson has to take this huge pay cut or whatever to, I think the Rams have dispelled the myth of not being able to spend as they much. They paid Jared Goff. They paid yeah. uh, Matt Stafford. That was 25% of their cap for two quarterbacks. Just just do a deal with Wilson. Raise his average per year, but, you know, structure it so the the meteor money is, is you know, down the line when the cap's going to rise anyway with the gambling money coming into the NFL and the fact that the, the NFL economy is as it seems to have survived handsomely through COVID. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd do that and really reduce his cap hit this year, potentially free up a load of money and put it with the money that you've already got. And then, you know, go and have a big splurge. You know, if it means going and getting a, a top end pass rusher, Stefan Gilmore to play across from DJ Reed, keeping Quandre Diggs and Dwayne Brown and people like that, you know, maybe even a few, a couple of left field signings, you know, making some bolstering your offensive line, not just retaining Dwayne Brown. And then just going into, I just love to, I, I hope whatever happens, Brandon, that off the back of the combat, the back of the draft, there are no holes on the roster like with centre last year and cornerback last year and pass rush the year before. That the, the, the roster generally looks done right. when, at the start of May. And that you, as Seahawks fans, we can just dream again. Because I personally, I know that you know not everybody feels the way that I do. And you know a lot, 
people think I've been really negative for a couple of years. If I just didn't, I, I didn't personally feel like the Silks had any real shot, you know, of going to the Super Bowl for the last few years. I, I'd love to sort of go into a season believing that was possible again. I, there's nothing better than that, you know, than the anticipation of that first game thinking, could this be the year, you know, that the Silks get back to the top. And I'd love for the off season to deliver that hope even if it doesn't happen ultimately, even if they just get a decent run and they get to an NFC Championship game, they 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 don't they go into a divisional round game and aren't twenty points down at half time. You know, it's I just love to sort of see the Seahawks back in a in a strong position. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that's going to unfold. Um, let's see if they're up to it because look, the Carroll's you know he's, he's he's not he's not got loads of years left. I don't see the point in making big massive trades for Jamal Adams and then being really conservative with your cap. You know, I think that's sort of a contradiction there. You might as well do both and be all in with Wilson for a couple of years here and see if you can do what the Rams have just done. Yeah, absolutely. Well, especially, I mean, shoot, if you aren't getting to that position in the next couple of years anyway, Russell's not going to want to stay for much longer. And so all the, all the stuff that we dealt with last year, you know, that might become even more of a reality, whereas I think this offseason, it, it feels a little bit more tame already than it did last year. But I think to to get where they need to be, though, Rob, is that they have to find a, a particular area of the team where they can immediately get better. And with, if it's not going to be through free agency, then it has to be through the draft. And do you see any of these position groups to where they they have the type where, where that group has the type of depth to where the Seahawks can get better immediately. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, it, it, there are numerous positions they could do that. I think it's a fantastic defensive line class. I think it's a bit top heavy at defensive tackle. So if there's if there's anybody in that, I suspect there will be Seahawks fans thinking uh, that what they really need is. You know, a really dynamic interior pass rusher. They've they probably needed that every year that Carroll's been in Seattle. <laughs> I, I think that the names will come off the board quite quickly there, and and that that is limited. But in terms of pass rushers off the edge, there are numerous options there. That there definitely will be an appealing option at forty-one if you wanted to go in that direction. Tackle. Let's say that the Seahawks make some big moves on the defensive line in free agency. I'd be surprised if there's not a, an attractive right tackle option at 41 because I think that there are some really good right, you know, right or left tackles in this class actually and I think there are some players that, that seem destined to stick on the board and, and not rise as high as maybe I thought they were going to so I think I think yes you know the, the two trench two areas of the trenches which is I think what most Seahawks fans would identify as the biggest needs you've got a lot of depth there I think that there are cornerbacks. There's a, a really good crop of cornerbacks in this draft. Linebackers, you know, if the Silks decided to save 16.6 million and move on from Bobby Wagner, there's a whole bunch of linebackers that are that are very, very attractive. Um, I, I don't I like going there, Rob, because here in here in Seahawks players talk, uh, I'm trying to think of of which player said it. Was it KJ? No, I think it was Sherman. He said, "If you move on from Bobby." Then, uh, then you're out of your your Super Bowl window. I think Richard says a lot of things. <laughs> um, indeed, uh, maybe Richard, if he said uh, fewer things, might still be uh, he, okay. He might it, it may have been overblown on his part on, he, on he, saying that. He's he seems to be on a mission to to ensure that he doesn't get that hero's welcome whenever he comes back to. <laughs> Uh, Lumen Field. So, uh, he just, uh, I, I don't think he can help being him. That's just who he is. Yeah. He, he, he's, he's that kind of guy who um, I, I think he's a, a great media personality. So I, I don't hold that against him too much. But we're talking about the trenches. And I let's start with that, because in terms of what people can watch, you know, I think last year, Center was one of those positions where a lot of us were interested in. It's it's continued to be a position. I think that there is some interest. Is there going to do you see any starting centers that that might fall to the Seahawks here in the second or third rounds this year? Yeah, I think that there is, it's a very small group, but there are some options. I think Tyler Linderbaum at Iowa has been projected numerous times during the college football season to go in the top ten, which was ridiculous, and. He's not going to be a top 10 pick. Uh, 
and even if he tests well, I think he's more of a late first round. But you never know. I mean, look, people were thinking that maybe Quinn Miners would be a top 40 pick and he lasted to round three. People thought Creed Humphrey was going to go maybe the end of the first round. He lasted to the end of the second. You know, there was, there's a whole book. For whatever reason, the league seems to be... It's not just a Seahawks thing here. The league generally doesn't rate centers as a premium position that you have to go and get right. very, very early. I don't think it's... I mean, look, and people will, laugh, will scoff at this because Tyler Linderbaum is one of those sort of big names in the draft. I don't think it's, it's beyond the realms of possibility that a 295-pound center is there at 41. So there's, he's, he's one option. I think Cameron Jurgens at Nebraska is going to test very, very well at the Combine. If you want a physical tone-setting center who is extremely athletic and plays with a violent attitude, then Cameron Jurgens is the man for you because he, I think he's great in a phone booth. He's very athletic, getting to the next level. There are clips on, if you go and put his name into Twitter search, you'll see him driving defensive backs 40 yards downfield while the play is ongoing. He actually got a flag for that play, but it was hilarious. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, and he just kicks people's ass. So, you know, if you want a, a center like that, then I, I, I feel like great. everybody wants a center like that, Rob. What are you saying? Yeah, for <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, apparently the Seahawks rather just, you know, have a converted undrafted guard play there. But, uh, you know, it, I think Cameron Jurgens. I've got him as a second round prospect. I, I know that he's not rated that highly by a lot of these other websites, but it, we'll, we'll see where he goes. And then there's Cole Strange, who had a. I think he had a really good senior bowl. He, he was one of those players who, like, you would have a really bad rep and then a really good rep. But the, the NFL seems to really value that that they show they learned from the previous play. I think he's got a really good solid anchor. I think he, the way that he sort of anchors his back and plants his feet. Is very reminiscent of of Quinn Miners. Um, a year ago, he even had his shirt rolled up to expose his belly. <laughs> yes. he, he wore he wore number sixty nine, which I know that some people of a certain age will enjoy. Um, and I, I thought he held his own in in a lot of the reps against the bigger names. He had some bad reps, he had some good reps, but I think he showed that if he can test well at the combine, that he has every chance to go in round two. And then there's a couple of other guys. You know, I think Zach Tom is a tackle who could convert inside. He's undersized. I think his best, best fit probably end up will be center at the, the next level. He might be more of a development guy, but I've got him ingraded in round three. And then there's Luke Fortner, who I thought had an okay senior bowl. His tape is okay. I think he's more of a fifth round type, fourth, fifth round type. You know, they're, they're the players that I would be looking at um, in terms of, of additions at center. So offensive line, they're going to be drilling on Friday, the 4th of March. And so what are the, what are the drills that you're going to be keyed in on when you're watching some of these guys go? The defensive linemen, it's very much the broad jump and the vertical jump is, is probably the thing that I will spend most time on. We've talked about it over the years, Brandon, that explosive traits are really valued by the NFL. You know, we always calculated, I have this formula called TEF, which is, you know, it's a breaks everything down and it's been in, it's been a good indicator of what the Seahawks look for over the years but increasingly it's become an indicator of who are the players who are going to be drafted early the the NFL is drafting explosive offensive linemen earlier and earlier every single year players are really elevating their stocks i think the broad and the vertical are very important and then you know from the on field workouts i think you can't beat a good kick slide you know a, a player who plays tackle is going to have to kick slide and they're going to have to you know, get into their set. They're going to have to show good footwork. And, you know, that can't be clumsy in that, in that kick slide. And the mirror drill, you know, because, again, it's a footwork thing. You know, you, a lot of this is just about balance and athleticism, isn't it? You know, it's about getting yourself, you are a 320-pound man. Can you get yourself quickly into position? So that all of the other things, the, the, the explosive traits and the hand work and you know hand placement getting your hands into the right areas using your strength dealing with counters well it all starts with getting into the right position off the snap so i think that you know the mirror drill and the kick slide are the two that i look for along with you know the combination of the bench press the vertical and the broad and i'll put all that stuff into a formula and in the evening of the offensive line workouts i'll be up until the early hours of the morning calculating all of those and sticking them on the blog so people can see who might be rising up boards as a consequence of their work. Yeah, it's definitely one of those formulas over the years that you've really helped dial into. And 
And yeah, if you want more into it, definitely check out Seahawks draft blog. You can see the history there. You can see where the Seahawks have rated out in previous years as to the guys that the C- that Seattle's taken. And I, I'm curious, though, in terms of the the offensive line, is there anything that you look at that just absolutely excludes them? I mean, is it if they if they don't broad jump well, if they don't do the vertical jump well, is, is that kind of an exclusionary metric then for Seattle or, or other teams too? I mean, there's, there's various things that sort of put me off. I mean, whether they put teams off. I mean, generally the Seahawks they don't tend to go for outliers until sort of day three and, and later in the draft. Like Stone Forsyth wasn't a particularly great test when he was tall, you know, six foot eight or whatever. And the Seahawks haven't drafted those kind of players, but they'll do it in round six. Uh, for me, it, it, there's a lot of things. Like, I don't like offensive linemen that are too big. Yeah. You know, I can't remember the guy's name a year ago, but there was that guard from Alabama, and he looked like he was about 30 pounds overweight, and everyone was going, he's a first-round pick, he's a second-round pick, and I was like, I'm not having that. And he was, I don't even know if he got drafted in the end. I mean, he was such a big name as well, and, I, you know, he, he just disappeared off the face of the earth when the, by the time the draft had come. And I think, you know, you look at someone like Daniel Folele at, at, at Minnesota, who is, you know, everyone's going, oh, he's 6'9 and 380 pounds. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that that sounds great, doesn't it? But he's not, you know, going for the World Wrestling Federation heavyweight championship. He's He actually has to get into position and block Nick Bosa. Right. And can he do that at that size? And at the Senior Bowl, he was getting mowed over by, by Jay Sanders, who's 242 pounds. And I'm thinking, well, if you can't even smother my, my Jay Sanders... How's he going to get on against the Bosa brother? You know, JJ Watt, Chandler Jones, although he could leave. I mean, you just think, I don't really want to see him against those guys if he can't handle this, you know, 242 pound defensive end from Cincinnati. So, hey, look, his kick slide's good. It's not too bad for his size. But, you know, I think you can be too big because the leverage, isn't there? You know, you've low man wins. And if you are that, you've got a huge body and it's you're so tall, it's basically just a big sitting target, like a very big dartboard. Yeah off the edge come and stick your hands here you know drive me backwards convert speed to power uh i i kind of prefer those athletic i always think a good athletic offensive lineman who is explosive if nothing else gives you a chance to get a really good guard so i'd I'd prefer to go for that and you know speaking of players who are a little bit more athletic it it kind of makes you wonder too if if anything is going to shift now that Mike Solari's out, I know we had the same question when Tom Cable moved on, but now that Andy Dickerson is moving up into that offensive line coach role, now that Shane Waldron's into his second year in the offense, you know how how could that potentially change? Now I think, like you said, the the trend in the NFL has been to to be toward more athletic and explosive linemen anyway, so. I, I guess I, I would expect that to continue to be the trend, even with Seattle, that, that they wouldn't move away from that necessarily. Well, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. I had a little breakdown in my combine preview, just referencing that the Rams have done things very, very differently. Their offensive line is, is the opposite of explosive. I mean, they, they have a series of jags playing on their offensive line, and yet they have the number one pass protecting success rate in according to ESPN in the NFL you know you, you Brian Allen's Austin Corbett Rob Havenstein David Edwards Joseph Noteboom they're among the the worst TEF testers of the last decade you know and yet they have come together and formed this really good solid offensive line maybe that's because Sean McVay is a really good coach and his system is so well drilled that they they're one of these teams that doesn't need stars on their offensive line can the Seahawks create that do Seahawks fans want that I would ask as well you know do you want them now to think what we need to do is is draft the least athletic offensive lineman we can find (laughs) and hope that this can come together because I would personally be a little bit scared about that I would rather have more of an all-star group of offensive linemen and and sort of invest in free agency and spend a high draft pick on a really good, you know, high upside player and shoot for the stars rather than hoping that, you know, oh, we'll just take a seventh rounder here and see if we can fit him in there at center. I, I would rather, I would rather that. Just one other thing that I also think is worth pointing out, and you know, I, I think experience on the offensive line. I, I, I think tackles who've played a lot of football, uh-huh. it generally shows. 
And also the guys who aren't like, you could look at someone like Nicholas Petit Frere, as who's Ohio State, and he's a five star guy, and he's gone to Ohio State. He's very well spoken and a nice guy. And, and I think he's got every chance to be a second round pick. But then you've got someone like Abina Easy, who's played like he's, he's played for TCU as well as Memphis. And then you watch sort of Nicholas Petit Frere, and he's an athlete, and he gets beaten on the inside counter all the time. And you think, yeah, that's a problem. And like, how's that going to, you know, is that you going to, is that an easy fix in the NFL? And then I watch Abina Easy, who no one talks about, and he just does this simple. He's got 35, 36 inch arms, which are helpful, and he just touches the guard off the snap. And he shuts down the inside counter every time. And then he's got the foot speed, the foot, the kick slide and the foot uh, quickness to get outside. And he, he basically shuts down the inside counter. He gets into position easily to prevent the speed rush off the edge. And he's got long 36 inch vines and he locks on and he finishes blocks. And I think, well, why is he, not? I've got him in round two. Cause I think I can work with that. I think teams can work with that. I mean, if he has a crap combine, he'll sink down the boards. If he's a good combine, I think he's going to go a lot earlier than people think. I think that is more beneficial than it's indicative of his experience versus someone who's played fewer games and maybe is getting by on five-star talent. Right. You see so many teams get excited about potential with these guys, when it, especially when it comes to some of these testing numbers, that, oh, with, with these kind of numbers, he could be this type of player when rather you just maybe look for the type of guy that he is and has that you know, football ability. And maybe, you know, you, you talked to earlier about the, uh, the Rams guys not having the type of athletic testing numbers. Maybe we even saw that a little bit with stone Forsyth. you know, when they picked him, it, it wasn't the testing numbers, but one of the things that they said is he was one of the better pass blockers in college. And I, I don't know if you necessarily agree with that or not, but, um, you know, noticing something that, that somebody does well, especially when Seattle historically has not gone after the better uh, pass blockers. I, that was just kind of a move, I think, that was and it wasn't until the sixth round, but it was outside of some of the things that they they've normally done in the past. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, is that if if you and I had we, you know, the, ran the 33rd front office uh, at the combine this week and we had a chance to sit in a room with every single one of these players, I guarantee that the draft board that you and I maybe would have going into that day or two days would be completely different by the end. Because what we don't aren't able to do is get to know these players right. and interview them and understand. Because I, I, bet, I bet the teams learn so much from that. And it's one of the frustrating things of the process, you know, as you see these like endless top 50, top 100 boards, you know, but every, I mean, I, there's so many mock drafts now that they kind of all mesh, meld into one great big mess of a mock draft. And, and you just think, yeah, but what, what are we getting out of any of this? You know, I kind of prefer those kind of Tony Pauline as a little nugget here that teams weren't impressed with this guy's interviews or they were blown away by this guy's interviews or the league is, is, is seeing this guy's going to go in round one that nobody expects. That's the information for me that is 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 more valuable at this point because, frankly, Half the people who have an opinion on these things haven't watched, you know, a one hundredth of the tape they need to to have an opinion, and the, and none of us have been in these meetings and got to know these players and understood what the, what makes them tick and whether you go for them. And like, I bet half the teams that draft these people, like the Rams, you know, they might have met Brian Allen and gone, "Well, he's a crap tester," but I'll tell you what, he had our scheme down. You know, he, he, he's exactly the kind. He's he's played in a system that we want, and we see him doing this. When we asked him this, he was he was. He, he was a quick learner on that or whatever. And they may just go, oh, we'll take him in round four. Right. And, and then he, if, oh, and the other thing is the scouts go to the, these colleges and they, they get to know that the coaches around there and they say, who are the coachable guys? And then they, you know, I, I bet coaches go up and go, Hey, John, this, keep an eye on this guy. He'd be perfect for your system. And that's just a bit of a nugget. And then they follow it up and they go, they go Oh yeah, he was right about that. He was, he is perfect for our system. We'd never know any of that. And how could we ever know that? How Because we're not there all the time. You're not talking to the coaches. So there's a lot of information that come by that, that we'd, all, we'd all benefit from that we never find out. No, we do get the the information in terms of the data with these uh, with the combine, though, and, and some of these numbers. And, and it can help. And, you know, I, I want to flip over to the defensive line, too, because and, and these guys are going to be going on Saturday. 
offensive line, defensive line. I, I feel like that's kind of where we're narrowing in on Rob as, as some of the places where it's important for the team. But also, you mentioned off the top that defensive line, the, the amount of depth and just looking at you know where you've kind of identified some of these, you know, your first round grades, second round grades, third round grades, looking at your spreadsheet, it is heavy on the defensive line, especially at the on the on the edge parts. Uh, it's terrific. There's, there are so many great options. I think if they had the number eleven pick, there's every chance they would have spent it on a pass rusher. Let's not go there, Rob. Uh, sorry, about I know that. we're going to be watching that entire everybody who gets picked, everybody who the or the guy who, who the Jets end up taking, or if they trade that pick away, we're we're all going to look for the next five years. We're going to look at that player and go, "Ooh, man, what if he could have been on the Seahawks?" It's, it's number ten as well, isn't it? Not number eleven. I made it. It's, it's one of those. It's it's a little bit. Uh, it, you know, it's it's one of the reasons why trading away first round picks can be so perilous, I guess, because you are one quarterback injury away from that being a, you know, last 10 pick to being a top 10 or 15 pick. And Russell Wilson had been so healthy over these past few years that it's, it kind of feels safe. And and so you start thinking that it's safe until it's not. And so the one year where maybe just a minor Russell Wilson injury could have benefited us in terms of draft status. Uh, it, it didn't work out, but yeah, that's the risk I mean, you take. I, the lesson from that is only ever spend blind picks if it's a you know a top 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 quarterback or a, you know something like an elite pass rusher. With, you know, and they're never available. Sure. So, um, but anyway, I, Boya Mafe would be fantastic for the Seahawks. I don't think he's. I think he's going to go in the first round. And I, what I was the kind of point I was making is I think he may even off the back of the combine be pushed towards that sort of top fifteen range. I think he is that good enough. He's going to run in the, the four fives. 40 inch vertical, do everything very, very well, speaks brilliantly. His, his post game press conference at the senior bowl was was outstanding. You know, it's the way he speaks, very mature individual. I think teams are going to fall in love with him. But I mean, I'd love to pair him with Daryl Taylor for the future. I think he would be fantastic. I think one of the big questions for the Seahawks is, you know, what exactly is the make of their scheme going to look like? Because we're hearing a lot about you know, three fours and more aggressive and stuff like that. And if they're looking for sort of an outside linebacker type, mm-hmm. then, it, then you know, it brings different players in. Like they'd be more in, inclined maybe to sort of consider someone like D'Angelo Malone, who had a very good senior bowl. Uh, I don't think his tape is as good as what he showed at the senior bowl. He's, I found his tape a little bit frustrating, but he's an, out, he's an undersized 235 pounds outside linebacker and he can definitely work in space. Uh, Dominic Robinson is similarly undersized. I've got both of these guys in round three, but an ideal outside linebacker. And, you know, if they test well, they could even get bumped up into round two. You've got Sam Williams at at Ole Miss, who was a late arrival at the Senior Bowl. He's probably going to run, you know, a very, very quick time. He's going to push towards 40 inches in the vertical himself. I'm interested to see what Arnold Ebiketti runs because on tape he shows real flashes of brilliance and he beats tackles off the edge with bend and lean and balance and uh, gravity-defying moves. That you know that has generally been what the Seahawks have looked for in pass rushers who do that. What is he going to do in test? Because he could be a first-round pick. He could be there at 41. What's George Karlaftis' arm length like? And you know, I think he's he's a stubby, you know, kind of individual. He's kind of built like a rock. I, I was almost, I almost said he was built like a potato because that's kind of like what I think of when I think <laughs> of his body type. But he's said to be, you know, in, set to run fantastic 40 short shuttle. You know, the times that have been projected from the short shuttle are outstanding and we'll get him in round one. But if he, if some of these other guys test brilliantly and he doesn't, then he could be there. I think MyJ Sanders is you could play outside linebacker, you can play defensive end. I think you need to get some weight on him, but he's going to test very, very well. So, you know, the, I'm just running off the names. You know, David and Nene, he's not even been invited to the combine, and I've got him in round four. You've got Kingsley and Ibarre. How's he going to test? You know, he could easily be a late first or a second round pick if he tests well. Cameron Thomas didn't do anything at the senior ball. He's a player. Travon Walker, I just keep seeing him mocked in top 15. I'm not sure he's going to test well enough for that. He could be more of an inside-out type, move him around. And then you've got Drake Jackson at, at USC, who is he's incredibly raw, does not have you know extensive highlights and tape that you can dig out and go, okay, he played well against this brilliant tackle. 
but there's just something there with him. And he he could I could see him going round two. I could see him lasting to round five. I mean, he's just it's just where where the team slot him in to to how this all comes together. So you know, I think if the Seahawks want to go past Russia at 41, they will find one who can be really productive for them. And I think ultimately, if you are going to get a game wrecking pass rusher, you're probably going to have to find them in the draft because they're just not readily available in free agency. And if you go and sign a Chandler Jones or whatever, you know, players like that, yeah, they can for the whole for a year or two. But you know, what you really want is is that sort of look the you know, the Rams with Aaron Donald. You know, you want I'm not saying you go and draft Aaron Donald, but you want someone who's, who's there, he's homegrown, he's there for years, he builds with you, you retain him, you keep them, and you 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 pull off a, a master stroke in the draft. And look, they they seemingly have done that with Daryl Taylor, and hopefully he can develop into a game wrecker. Can they get another one in this draft, you know, to play, play across from him? Or can they get that defensive tackle, Brandon, who can break things up from the inside? Because there's definitely some good defensive tackles as well. And if Seahawks fans are going to be watching those drills, I know you break down in your blog that uh, one of the things that to, to really watch for in terms of pass rushers, you know, you point out that Bruce Irvin and Frank Clark, in terms of their short shuttle runs, they were you know, 403 and 405. So they're, you're really looking for that low fours in terms of short shuttles. Um, the 10 yard splits and the 40 yard dash can be important too. I know Cliff Averill was known for having a really uh, one of yeah. the best ever 10 yard splits at that spot. So um, those are some of those metrics that they tend to look for. Anything else that you want to mention and it, that people should watch for? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think. You know, general athleticism, you know, how do they run the 40? Are the explosive, you know, explosive traits still matter? So you broaden your vertical. I think for the edge rushers who are, you know, lean, you know, those sort of definite athletic edge rushers rather than inside out rushers or defensive tackles. If you can get a, a 10 yard split in the 1.5s, that, that's really what you want to see. So, you know, they're, they're the things. And, you know, I think with the inside out rushes, you know, I, I'm ta- I talked about all the edges there, and it's quite a long list that I went through. Very quickly, want to just mention to you, Brandon. Yeah. Josh, Josh Pichal at Kentucky is an absolute demon. You know, he is, wow, you know, explosive. I mean, he has not got the edge rush that, you know, he's not going to fly off the edge and dip and bend and, you know, round the art and straight into the quarterback. That's not him. You know, he isn't Daryl Taylor. But my word, has he got star potential as just somebody who is is a bully. I mean, he, he's a fantastic athlete. He's going to run a great short shuttle, so he's not just all about power. He, he's going to run a terrific short shuttle. I would, I would expect a decent 40, but he just, he'll bulldoze. He'll, he'll line up on the inside and just destroy a center. Just plow them out the way and get to the quarterback. He, he plays off the edge. He, he, he handles space and you know, any of those stretch runs or anything. He's all over it. I, I just love Josh Pichal. And he, he's recovered from cancer. He, he was a team captain for, I think, like three years in a row. I think he's the first one ever at Kentucky. If the Seahawks take him at, at 41, Brandon, I think they've got a chance to, to draft a star, uh, a, real, a real star uh, player. And, you know, there's others, Logan Hall, DeMarvin Leal has kind of sunk a little bit because he, the idea of DeMarvin Leal is better than the reality of DeMarvin Leal. So that Carter at Senior Bowl had a decent time and I think he's got a lot of potential. And and can I just say a defensive tackle as well? You know, everybody knows about Jordan Davis and Devontae Wyatt. You had a great Senior Bowl, Wyatt. Perion Winfrey had a good Senior Bowl. Travis Jones is, you know, people don't understand how good an athlete he is. And and he's going to come to this combine and people think, ah, oh, nose tackle. And was, everyone will have seen the senior boy was like one arm, straight in that, right, that one arm, driving everybody back into the quarterback. Every single bloody rep was, you know, a, a pressure because of that. But he's, I think he's going to run well. I think he's going to test well. I th- he, whether, whether he's explosive or not, we'll see. But certainly with the agility and the speed, I think get ready because there's some big men in this draft, who are going to who are going to blow up this combine? Travis Jones, Devontae Wyatt, the the other big man at George Jordan Davis is going to run very very well. People go and have a look on Twitter and see him doing drills, testing for the uh, practicing for the combine. Yeah, 
My God, he's three hundred and forty pounds and he's moving around like a two hundred fifty pound linebacker. It's really incredible. Do you think and guys it, like Davis or Wyatt they they have the potential to fall to the second round though? No, I think okay. Davis is is going to be long gone. I mean, Wyatt, I think he's going to be long gone as well when he runs a four eight at the combine. So well, I I think they'll be gone. But I, I you know I, maybe not from a silk perspective, but just enjoy guys watching. to watch the guys to enjoy <laughs> watching. Yeah, I think Travis Jones is one to watch because I really like the idea of the Seahawks getting a defensive tackle. Yeah, and I think Josh Pichal, you know, I, again, you know, maybe with the way that they're sw- if they are switching to a you know this three four hybridy type thing, then uh, maybe he's not going to be for them, and they're going to look for an outside rusher. But let's just say that they got one in free agency. I'd love to see Pichal as like an inside out rusher. Okay. You know, who can really sort of just make plays, TFLs, sacks get after it heart and soul type and you know i just you know daryl taylor hits people in the face and you know and i think that josh bashar will do that as well i definitely think they need to find somebody like that and and finding them in the second round i mean and when you talk about guys uh, that can make a difference on the offensive line defensive line it seems like that's the natural place to go but if they don't let's say they they pass on offensive line defensive line with that second round pick that first one that they have if you had to pick a position, Rob, which one would you go to, that gives them the best opportunity for a difference maker? It's not in the trenches, then the best opportunity for a difference maker. Could be tight end. They have some needs at tight end. Could be cornerback, obviously. If, if DJ Reed moves on in free agency, they're going to have a hole to fill there. You know, Could they bring back Sidney Jones and pair him with Trey Brown? Maybe. Um, and, and they've never gone as early as the second round for a corner. So would that be a type of spot? I safety gosh you think about uh quandre diggs could he move on in free agency and and is there somebody who could slide in naturally and take over the that spot right away i i guess that's where my mind's at when i think of somebody who can be a difference maker early in the second round i I think the answer to all of those positions is yes (laughs) Uh, i mean i think that the linebacker group is is tremendous and you know not all i don't want to move on for bobby i explicitly avoided uh, (laughs) saying any linebackers rob (laughs) i think that is a that is a position though where some of these guys might end up going late first or you know a lot of people like devin lloyd a a bit bit more than i do i lose production i want to see him test but you know leo chanel you know and, and one thing i will say and sorry to interrupt but linebacker is one of those positions that I feel maybe has been devalued a little bit in terms of their draft position. Agreed. Um, but, you know, you, you, I think Channing Tindall is a, is, a, is a missile. You know, he just flies around the field. He, he's going to test very, very well. You know, Quay Walker at, at Georgia as well is very, very good. Nicobe Dean's more of an you know, attacking, aggressive. But if they, want, if they want that type, you know, I think he could probably play outside linebacker as well as inside. So, um, Brian Asamoah, just oh my word, you know, Asamoah and Tyndall, the way they get from the middle of the field to the sideline is just remarkable. And then Leo Chanel, I, you know, if you want someone who can blitz and get in the backfield and be aggressive, then then that's him. And he's apparently going to run a 4 0 short shuttle. So, and then you've got Damone Clark and Chad Moomer as well. People think it's going to go around too. So, there's a whole bunch of options there. I mean, it's safety in, in place of. Potentially replacing uh, Quandre Diggs, yeah, you know, Daxton Hill could, could end up being a corner project with the way that he's going to test. He's going to probably be the star of the combine with his testing results. I love Kirby Joseph as somebody who I think a bit like he's not the same player as Quandre Diggs, but he's not like an. I don't think he's going to run like a four four or four three or something. But I think he can play free safety still. I think he's got that sort of ability to get around, you know, the the deep end, and you know, you see examples of him making interceptions. I think he had five. Last season, the Seahawks typically, when they look for free safeties, people who can mock Tedrick Thompson, he had six interceptions in his final season, and Earl Thomas had eight in his final season at Texas. They look for that sort of production. Kirby Joseph had five inceptions last year. Lewis C, uh, I don't know if it's seen or sign, just, just runs up to the line and hits people in the face. You know, he's very aggressive. Brian Cook is a great, very underrated player at Cincinnati, can be a leader. And I think he is, he's kind of like that Quandre Diggs type safety. So, you know, and then there's Jukon Brisker. A lot of other people like him more than me, but he's going to test very, very well. Uh, you mentioned tight end. Uh, you know, the, there are players that, you know, whether it's Greg Dulcich, Trey McBride, Jalen Widemeyer, Jeremy Ruckett, Jake Ferguson have all got a chance to be starters. Kate Otten's got a chance to be a starter, but he's got red flags with injuries. 
so you know all of those players could end up being really productive tight ends. Receiver, it's a, it's another loaded receiver class. You know that, there isn't a, a Jamar Chase, but there's you know all sorts of options. But I, I don't think they can. I, do I that. was definitely noticing the depth wasn't wasn't at the top, but once you got into the third and fourth and fifth yeah. round, you you definitely had a lot of depth stacked in the in those rounds as far as where you ranked guys out. I mean, if I was going to say, you know, if it wasn't trenches, I think the most. And there's cornerbacks as well. I think that the the position that I would say gives you the best chance to get a great player is probably linebacker or tight end outside of the trenches at 41. But I, I think that I would expect that their focus is going to be the trenches. You know, Rob, one thing that I, I feel like you've keyed in on, though, when uh, talking about these players that, that you've really become interested in, in seeing how they perform at the Combine I've heard you use the, the the word aggressive, and I know that's a word that Clint Hurt used in his yeah. press conference. And so I, I'm wondering if their draft strategy, especially on defense, is going to is kind of going to find, follow that mindset that we that we hear from Pete Carroll wanting to be more aggressive. Clint Hurt saying that they want to be more aggressive. Are you specifically keyed in then on some of these guys who you feel are aggressive type players? And I, I feel like most guys on defense should generally be that way, but I, I suppose a corner, um, you know, there's zone corners that tend to fit better in that sort of scheme than, than man corners. So, uh, you know, and we, we really haven't talked about corners too much. If, if they are going to be going to a, maybe a more aggressive style on defense, it could be playing more man coverage. Do you see any cornerbacks who may excel particularly in man coverage? Yeah. I think with man coverage, it's, it's about speed, isn't it? You know, more than anything, and, and look, we've we've become accustomed to looking at Seahawks cornerbacks, and 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 often, you know, what I used to say was that you could tell it was a Seahawks cornerback before they even set off to run their forty yard dash. Just you know, the, you know, you could see them. You know, the, the example that I always come to is that Trey Flowers stood there as a safety at the combine and set off and ran his forty. And I wrote on the live blog, Trey Flowers is a Seahawks cornerback because he just he looked like a Seahawks cornerback. So it was, it, and he ended up they drafted him and they immediately moved into corner. It's one of my favourite hits. I wish he was actually a good player so that we could talk <laughs> about it more. But um, I think now, if you are going to play more, you know, the fact that they've they've had success with Reed and they and they tra- tra- uh, they drafted Brown and you know they're, they're talking about using more man coverage. It, it's not so much the length and it's not so much the size and it's not so much the physicality. It really is if you're going to play a lot of man. Can you run alongside a really quick, fast, dynamic receiver, whether that's a crossing route, whether that's a post, whether it's deep, you know, whatever it is, can you stick with them if you're running 40 yards or 10? So, you know, and, and what I would be looking for amongst these, this, these cornerbacks this year is not so much maybe the, is this a Seahawks cornerback? And more so, how fast does this guy run? You know, when you're watching the drills, how's the back pedal? how the transition set off, you know, just how smooth do they look when they're running? And that's really going to be it. And, and as, are they, am I going to, am I focusing on that aggressive style of player? I want violence in the team. You know, I, I kind of feel like that the great seal, and, oh, look, whenever you bring, up, if you even just have to make a passing reference to the LB now, and people sort of jump down your throat and go, you're never going to recreate, recreate that again. And I get it. I'm not going to, I don't, I don't. We're never going to have Steve Hutchinson and Walter Jones on the offensive exactly. line again either. Exactly. But I, I do think that what, what I really miss about that team is that I was, I don't know why, but I was kind of watching the, the, the Saints. I watched highlights of the Saints game from 2013. Mm-hmm. And the first play from scrimmage was a four yard tackle for a loss for Brandon Mayburn. And I just watched that and I just, and I, and I watched it from a perspective of the Saints, you know, and I watched, I focused on Breeze rather than the defensive line. And I, and I just thought to myself, God, I, imagine being a Saints game at the start, a Saints fan at the start of that game. And you see that as the first play and you're looking at that defense and you just think, how the hell are we going to win this game today? Like, and that was the first play. And I just want the Seahawks defense, you know, when you watch the Seahawks defense in 2021, give up. Like the drives that they gave up against Minnesota, for example, where they barely laid a finger on them. Mm-hmm. And it was like a 16 play drive and a 12 play drive and an 11 play scoring drive. And you just think, I, I can't bear that anymore. You know, I want aggressive, violent defense. I want a team to play the Seahawks and fear playing the defense again. They, they, and, and if they give up a few more big plays because they're blitzing more or they're playing man coverage, ah, I'll take it. 
for aggression and just a tougher team, you yeah. know, I, and, and I want to see that. And I think that there are some tough players. It's, it's harder these days that, you know, you, you kind of always keeping an eye out for that Cam Chancellor, Richard Sherman attitude. It's, it's harder and harder to find these days because the game has changed a lot, even in 10 years. But, you know, but, uh, you know, the, there are there are players that, you know, Damian Pierce provides it at running back. You know, he's an incredibly violent runner. Um, you know, at tackle, Trevor Penning, very aggressive. I think that Tyler Smith, the, the other, ta- you know, the smaller school tackle is is, is very, very aggressive. You look at somebody like uh, Cameron Jurgens, who we talked about. I think he provides a bit of that. Perry and Winfrey played with his hair on fire at the senior bowl. I think Federian Mathis has got a, a degree of toughness about him. Josh Pichal, who I've already mentioned. At, at linebacker Leo Chanel that I already mentioned. But I think, you know, Channing Tindall and Brian Asamoah have got have got a lot of that as well. Nate Landman, who could be a, the day three type guy, they call him the hammer at Colorado. Cam Taylor Britt, cornerback at Nebraska. Has he got the speed that the Seahawks are going to look for? Not sure. But he's a great hitter, great tackler, hammers people. Montaric Brown, I like him a lot. You know, the, the corner at Arkansas, I think he can do that. Lewis Sino, I mentioned at safety, toughness, aggressiveness. Brian Cook's got a bit of that. Nick Cross has got a bit of that. You know, I think Jalen Amar Davis has got that, the cornerback at, um, at Alabama. Roger McCleary's got that. You know, it just I just want to see him scare a few opponents, you know, yeah, fearful I, playing Seattle again. And I think that they still have some of those players on the team who can be that, who can who can be those aggressive type players. I that's where I think coaching has the ability to come in. I mean, if if a coach is just asking you in terms of your job, well, don't get beat deep. And so everybody's dropping back and they're giving guy plenty of space. So that way they they don't make a mistake that allows a guy to to get down the field. Then I, I think that it's going to it's going to show up. And that's what has shown up in these past couple of years. So I, 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 I think they need a lot more. I think yeah. Daryl Taylor is definitely, a, you know, the kind of guy that I'm talking about here. Yeah. You know, he you don't just, think Jordan ooh. Brooks can be that guy or Jamal Adams has <sighs> the ability to, to be that guy. Jordan Brooks, maybe. Quandre I Diggs, mean, I, I know I, we, we've seen him be that physical type of, of, of guy too. I think Brooks, potentially, but yeah. I think Brooks is more athletic than aggressive. Okay. Jamal, Jamal Adams, to me, I mean, I, 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 I apologize for, for bringing this up on your show, Brandon, <laughs> because this is very much something. But I, like, I call him the peacock. I think he is a show-off. I think he is a five-star elite recruit who then had an elite uh, college team that he played for. He then went to play in New York, where he was given a lot of praise, and then he's been, tr- you know, had a huge trade haul and a salary in Seattle. And I, and I don't think he's had any adversity in his career. Really, I think he he ducks so many short range, you know, short yardage tackles. I don't think he fills his holes enough. I think he's protecting his shoulders. I don't think he's a, he's a, a scary player in the slightest. I think he is a person who is fantastic at uh, going up to opponents and sarcastically applauding them when they've made completions for first downs. I think he's a he's a yapper he's like, <laughs> all the way through the game. I don't I don't find him remotely scary. And if I was an opponent, I wouldn't you know. And, and look, I think I hope the next season they just accept. He is what he is. Just having playing at the line of scrimmage and saying, "Well, we're just going to have him trying to break into the backfield and make plays," because I think that's where he can be effective. But as a, you know, it is disrespectful to the memory of Cam Chancellor to think that he is even a tenth of what Chancellor was as a tone setter. Oh, and I, I wasn't putting him in that category. No, I no, was, uh... but I think they drafted. I think they traded for him, hoping that he was going to be that same kind of physical. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't know. I haven't got a good sense of of what you know because of the multi. You know, they haven't really dialed in on what they seem to want him to be over these last couple of years. And so, I I think Clint was right when he said that it is up to him to figure out how to yeah. use him the right way. That is going to be one of his biggest jobs in 
you know, it, it probably is more of the the box safety type. And if that ends up being more of a linebacker role to where they, you know, if they consider him a safety and they have two other safeties on the field, I, I think that could play into how they decide to use him on defense. But I, I think my, my main point was, is that he can be that guy. Maybe, maybe we haven't seen it, but I do think that he has the ability. So if they can get that ability out of him, that's key. Uh, Trey Brown's another guy that I'd point to and say we saw some some really aggressive hits uh, when he was on the field. So if he can stay healthy and and be that type of player too, I I just I think that with the right mentality of a lot of these guys, I I think that they have some of those players. Now they absolutely need to to find some of those guys in the draft too. And so once they do I, that, I think every team yeah. has every team has a couple of guys. Yeah, I, I you know I think that the difference for me is that I want the Seahawks to. You know, it's all it's all well and good having a couple of guys who you know have got scary eyes. It, you know, you, what you really want is a, is a is a unit that that terrifies opponents. And and when you talk uh, about you know, I, before I lose the thought, bringing up Cam Chancellor, I really do feel like it was that mentality that you know they had that guy. He was he was really the identity, and so. When you, just as you talk about Marshawn being the identity mm. of of that physical, aggressive guy on the offense, when those guys make the plays, I, I do think that it has an effect on the other type, the, the other players on that side of the ball. So if you have that leader and that presence like Cam was, I he was so important, I think, to that LOB defense. And and really, I I don't know how you're going to to find a guy quite like him ever again. But, uh, you know, it's it's. If you can get close to finding that guy, then I think that could be a huge difference maker. I think that you've hit on a, a good point there. That I think a lot of the success of the Seahawks when they won the Super Bowl was Marshawn and Cam, and the attitude and the connection of offense and defense that those two players alone brought, and the attitude, and they they pulled everything together. And I think part of the problem now is that you know if you're looking at who can do that now? And you look at the offense, you say, okay, you know, you had Marshawn in, mm-hmm. in 2013. You've, you've essentially got two broken running backs who can't stay healthy. And I, I love, I've, everybody enjoyed watching Michelle Penny in the season, but, you know, he's not been able to stay healthy. And, and I don't a, think he can be that guy. No, I think you would have to, You, I think you'd have to, I think DK would have to be that guy if you're going to pick somebody on offense. Yeah. And, and, and even with him, you know, I, I think he is extremely talented, but I, I'm not sure that he is, you know, Marshawn was Marshawn. You know, oh, yeah. and, and, and <laughs> you're you, never you going to find a guy like Marshawn either. I'm, I'm saying you're, you're no, trying no, no. to, but you're but just trying to get 90% or 85%. Attitude, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's DK Metcalf to me is, a he, he's, he's, he's very, you know, athletic and he looks physical, but I, I still think that's more of your finesse player really he, his best aspect is to get downfield and take the top off a of defense um well and he's not really, somebody you know, who you don't beat people up and then well you because know, so he, you, you know the the number of touches that he gets i mean even to, for him to get 10 touches in a game that would be it really does have to be a running back who's who's really going to set yeah, the tone in I, that way i think or i mean maybe tight end i, I feel like george kittle sets the tone in that way for the well, niners I, I think so. I mean, I, you know, I, I think if from, from you know, looking at, I think if they had something like Damian Pierce in the backfield, you could potentially set a tone. Um, I mean, Chris Carson could do it, but he's never he's right. never healthy enough to, to to be that guy. And then on the defense, you know, I think I I genuinely believe they traded for Jamal Adams to 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 be that presence on defense first and foremost. I think that's what their plan was that this guy is going to be our Cam esque leader. And I think it's a problem now because I, he isn't. And I worry about the shoulder. So I really want to get some aggressive players. I think there are, there are definitely sort of like you could get three or four really aggressive players in this in this draft, violent players that, that are needed, that are also good players. And, and then I think in free agency, I think you should set up a plan which enables you to add even more. I mean, like I've, I've said to a couple of people now, on the British broadcast of the Super Bowl, they had this quite eclectic mix of players that were on the broadcast. Kirk Cousins sat in his house, in his basement, <laughs> Warren Moon and Calais Campbell. You know, I don't know why those three in particular, but there this we is are. an eclectic group. <laughs> uh, 
And Calais Campbell spent the entire game. He was actually in the state in the arena. He he spent the entire game, you know, just shouting at the TV that he was desperate to play in that game. You know, he and you know he, he was angry and pumped and emotional about being desperate to play in a Super Bowl. And then at the end of the broadcast, they were like, "So you're definitely playing next year?" Oh yeah, I am definitely. There is no way I'm retiring. I'm I'm getting back. To, I need to be in this game next year. You know, and I just sort of sat down. I was like. Sign him. I've been wanting sign to sign him. Calais Campbell ever since he was with just Arizona. Sign, just <laughs> sign the guy and put him at the heart of your defense. If you want to be aggressive, Calais Campbell will take a couple of blockers for you and let your linebackers and, or Jamal Adams blitz. You know, because he will. He, he got an eighty odd PFF grade. The guy's, you know, that old saying, "Pissed off for greatness." That's the vibe I got from that little broadcast there. And he wants to play on. And I keep reading things like, it's unclear whether Calais Campbell <laughs> intends to carry on. I'm like, you should have been yeah. watching the British, British <laughs> Super Bowl broadcast because it's, it's no, not unclear to you. No <laughs> doubt whatsoever. And, um, you know, I, I just think he'd be, you know, if you're talking about aggressive physical yeah. players with an attitude, I, I think, you know, th- there'd be a picture of Calais Campbell in the dictionary if you were, uh, if they have pictures in dictionaries. Um, but, you, you know, you that's, that's what I'm talking about, you know, him up front. Some aggressive linebackers. I I'm not as um, keen on keeping Bobby as you are. I I think he is. I think he's well past his best. I mean, I'm just a I loyal he, Seahawks fan, Rob. I, I mean, you know. Yeah, I, I I'm <laughs> one of those disloyal. Uh, you know, um, uh, there's a few other words I've been called as well over the last couple of years. But it, it you know, I I think that he has become hesitant and. I think he avoids contact at times, and and I and I think if you're going to play aggressive defense, I think I, I'd love to see Brooks uh, next to a maybe somebody else, but and spend sixteen point six million on it on the trenches. But we'll we'll see, you know, we'll see, we'll see if if they can get him if they keep him, which I think they probably will. Um, whether they can get him back to some semblance of form, because uh, I I thought he he, he cut a, a player that I I almost thought he might retire this off season the way he was playing, so. Um, we'll we'll see what happens with that. There is a lot more to watch, especially as we get into free agency, Rob. And I know I'm going to be coming back to you here after the combine and leading up to the draft. So we're going to have a lot more to talk about in these next few weeks. And uh, yeah, so, you know, even though maybe you hurt my feelings a little bit with the Jamal Adams talk and the Bobby Wagner talk, I'm, <laughs> we're still friends. You know, we'll still talk about this leading up to the draft. And I, I always appreciate you coming on and, and giving your thoughts. Anytime, Brandon. It's always a pleasure. And uh, here's to a great combine and a great free agency and a great draft for the Seahawks. And uh, anytime you want to chat about it, I'll be there. And I think with that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks.